Hey, what's up? You're listening to The Long Game, and I'm your host, David Lee Kim, co-founder of Omniscient Digital. In this episode, we chat with Tanuka Karunaratne. Tanuka is the co-founder and CEO of Daydream, a platform that helps companies automate programmatic SEO from end to end. You can learn more about Daydream at withdaydream.com. Prior to that, he ran Flixed, a company that he bootstrapped and used programmatic SEO to refer over 100,000 subscribers to companies like Hulu, Disney, HBO Max, and more. He was also an entrepreneur residence at Hustle Fund and chief of staff to the COO at Pango, a cybersecurity company with over 100 million in annual revenue. In this conversation, we talk about the recent changes in SEO, AI, and its impact on our jobs and how we'll do SEO moving forward. Tanuka has a lot of interesting insights and perspective on all the flux that's happening in the industry, and I think you're going to learn a ton. Here's my conversation with Tanuka. Tanuka, welcome to The Long Game. Thanks, Ben. Thanks for having me. Let me just start with the intro of, of you and then you fill in the gaps that, that you think I might be missing. So you're currently CEO of Daydream, which is a tool to help people automate programmatic SEO from end to end. And then before that, you founded Flix, which actually used programmatic SEO to drive subscribers to businesses like Disney, HBO Max, uh, Hulu. And then you're also entrepreneur residence at Hustle Fund, which we'll get to what exactly that means, but curious if you fill like, any gaps or anything I'm, I'm missing there. For sure. So yeah, that, that's a good encapsulation. Uh, I'm the founder of Daydream. We're automating programmatic SEO from end to end. It's a venture-backed company. Prior to that, I started Flixed, which was a bootstrap company that was doing essentially lead gen for streaming companies using programmatic SEO. Uh, in parallel with that, I was also chief of staff the CEO at a later stage cybersecurity company. And then before that, I uh, was working on building a bunch of like affiliate blogs and things like that in high school and through college. And that's how I learned a lot uh, of what I know about SEO. And then somewhere in there, I also became an EIR. And we can talk about that as well. So uh, you, you kind of mentioned it really briefly here that you you worked on a couple of things in high school. And I saw that you founded a company in like your last year of high school called Admark Technologies. And my understanding is it, it sounded like a like a bunch of affiliate blogs. Tell us about that. Like, how'd you end up, end up doing affiliate in high school? Yeah, so I think the initial interest was more like, how do I make money online? So I played a lot of MMORPGs, uh, spent a lot of time in those games, and I actually found it to be a pretty interesting experience for learning about like buying, selling, how virtual economies work, all that kind of stuff. But over time, I got really interested in this idea of like, what if I can make real money online? And the reason I had that thought was because I had a brother at the time. Well, I still have a brother. (laughs) Uh, So my brother at the time was uh, running a blog about programming and he was making like a hundred bucks or something a month off of Google uh, AdSense. And I was really fascinated by this idea that you can sit at your computer and make money online. And so I got interested in that. I tried all kinds of things from when I was like 12 years old. I can still even see some of my forum posts <laughs> I made in these forums, like clicking ads for a tenth of a cent or like filling out surveys. Like I did a bunch of stuff like that. Eventually, the thing that really worked for me was um, the like learning how to do SEO. So I grew up in Canada. And at the time, Canada's Netflix catalog was much worse than the American one. And so it was a pretty common thing to change the DNS on your device to be uh, like American DNS and then get into the American Netflix. This was before Netflix was super aggressive about cracking down on VPNs and things like that. Uh, But when I would search for like, what are the best American or most reliable American DNS servers, it was not clear. So what you'd have to do is go to Reddit or YouTube comments of like different videos and people would talk about this stuff. So I'm like, this sucks. What if I just make a blog that I, where I personally test all the DNS servers and just keep it updated on a daily basis. So I built that. Uh, I think I built it on like Weebly or Wix or, or something like that. <laughs> and uh, initially it was, it was really like, okay, this is something valuable. Um, I made a couple of YouTube videos about how to, how to access American Netflix on like, YouTube 
or sorry, no, it's not on YouTube. How do I access American Netflix on like PlayStation, on your iPhone, on different devices? And started getting some traffic. I had like maybe a few hundred visitors a month. And I'm like, man, this sucks. I'm, I put Google AdSense on it myself. I'm like, I'm making like 50 cents a month or something. This is useless. So I was about to sell the website for like $200 on a forum. And then something started to happen. So I guess probably because I was I kickstarted the growth of the website a little bit using the YouTube referral traffic. I started to rank on Google for like, like Netflix DNS codes. And at some point it was even number one or number two for American Netflix period, which was like just amazing. And that website started to get like several hundred thousand visitors a month. And I'm like, wow, I got a lot of traffic now, but I still have no money. Right. So this is like the SEO piece. Then the affiliate piece was, hey, actually a VPN is a much more reliable way to solve this problem. Like you have to pay a little bit, but it's always working versus these DNS codes that were located who knows, like DNS servers that were located who knows where and run by who knows who that would stop working all the time. And then after I did that, that's when it started to work. So that's when I was like, wow, this is my first real thing that worked, that made money. And that's how I learned like the fundamentals of SEO is like brute trial and error. And that's how I also figured out affiliate as like the monetization mechanism on top of SEO traffic. So that was like the basis for my knowledge of how I learned about all this stuff. Yeah. And then I imagine you started finding ways to scale up like the content production for Flix, right? Because I actually just took a look and you cover all the various, or I don't know if you still own it or run it anymore, but it seems like it was covering all the various ways of asking how to watch X show or how to watch some channel or something. And you definitely didn't write that all manually, I imagine. Yeah, yeah. So the programmatic piece really came in. So like, you know, I had my early start with the, the Netflix DNS codes thing I mentioned, but the Flix piece really came through when I started to, I was, I was looking around for new verticals to enter. I realized in the US streaming was booming like crazy. And there was a lot of search volume for how to watch this or that. And the question was like, I can't write my way to answering every question about how to watch every piece of content. So how do you solve that problem? Well, you basically have to build a data set of where all the streaming content is, keep it up to date, and then automatically generate a page for every question about how to watch something. And that's actually the best way to answer that question, because if a person is writing that, they're not going to be able to react fast enough when it gets dropped or added to a different streaming service. So yeah, Flix was basically founded on that premise. It's like, um, if I'm actually going to do SEO really well, I need to automate it. Uh, and that became like a programmatic SEO play. And we would drive the traffic to companies like Disney or Hulu, HBO. And when the subscriber converted to a subscriber or either a free or paid subscriber, we would get a commission. So that entire business was really about driving like tens of thousands of people to these streaming services, but they were all reached through programmatic SEO. So I spent uh, a couple of years just focused on programmatic SEO because that was the only thing that would work in our space. There's not like another alternative channel that we can diversify or whatever with. It's like either you do that well or nothing. So that's how I became interested in the space. Was there no like arbitrage opportunity? Because I'm assuming if you're pointing these folks to, I don't know, Hulu or Netflix, I don't know what their LTV is, but if you could get a click and convert them for a couple of dollars and get like a kickback from them, like did, did the numbers not work out that way? I think partly, I think there were some challenges there. Like one, I think was, I was just not as specialized into the paid side of things at that time. Um, there were companies that entered, but we, we had talked to a number of companies in the space and it seemed like in general, the unit economics were like pretty hard. And my thought was I could, I could spend time on that or I could just really try and dominate SEO and organic. And I felt much, I felt like my efforts would compound a lot more. Uh, that way. So it's possible it could have worked out, but um, we chose to focus really hard on SEO and organic. How did building Flix end up kind of leading to you building Daydream? And maybe you can share folk, share with folks like what exactly you're, you, you're building at Daydream as well. Yeah, for sure. So on the Flix side, when I was building Flix, w- which I still own, I have another group that runs it now. Uh, so I can focus on Daydream. But when I was running Flix, I noticed a couple things. So one is I would have heads of growth or founders of other companies, venture-backed companies, come and ask me to do this for them. And I had no interest because I was running my own company. But it was interesting. I'm like, wow, there seems to be a lot of interest in this very niche thing I'm doing. Like, why is that? And 
over time, I realized it was because a lot of these heads of growth were very familiar with programmatic SEO because Zapier had done it to for you know to a pretty high level. You just search like how to connect any two SaaS companies, and you'll see Zapier come up. Or Canva, if you search like template for blank, Canva comes up. So they were familiar with the playbook, but I think what I realized is a lot of heads of growth have a hard time assembling the right team to run the programmatic playbook, which is more complicated because it requires end resources product thinking, SEO expertise. Like, There's a lot of distinct skills you have to combine to get it working. That was one. So I noticed demand. The second was um, when we built the programmatic SEO engine at Netflix, you know, uh, a lot of the team was technical, um, but we really had to put in a lot of work to get the whole thing working. And the process was pretty painful. So when I saw, particularly around like when GPT 3.5 came out, it really became clear to me that the technology was kind of in a place where you could now automate huge pieces of the like what was required to build programmatic SEO in a way that was much easier than in the previous generation. And I think the third thing is like I just felt like my personal learning curve was flattening on just running a lead gen company. And I was ready for my next challenge. So all three, all three of those things together, like there's demand. This is something I've specialized in for a long time. The technology seems to be right. And personally, I'm ready. It just made me feel like this is right now the right time to start Daydream. Yeah, it, it sounds like at least on, on your end, all the stars were aligning. And it kind of, as they would have it land at a time when there's also a lot of macro changes in SEO. And so we'd love to hear you speak to some of those changes around like, chat GPT, LLMs, SG, and all that, and also like why it's important that you're building Daydream now to maybe serve some of those things? Yeah, so at a high level, I think the way companies will reach users through search is just changing on two very foundational uh, levels. So one is the place that people take their search queries to and the way that those questions are served is changing a lot. So what does that mean? It means that you know, for the first time in like 20-ish years, Google feels pretty threatened, it seems like. Um, so Google is taking its own spin on how to adapt to uh, a lot of the generative AI developments by launching SGE. And obviously, that's been a very like, bumpy road for them. But they seem to be uh, finding a coherent direction now. But at the same time, now Google is being challenged by a bunch of other alternative ways to serve these search queries, which I think first came through, uh, or the first big one was like ChatGPT, obviously, but now you have Perplexity, you have Anthropic. You have a lot of alternative ways to get your search queries served that are not just getting 10 blue links. So what it means to optimize for search is changing quite a bit. It's no longer that you just focus on Google, or at least, in, you know, Google still has such crazy market share, but in five to 10 years, I don't think the reality is one where you just optimize for Google and then you forget about it and you're just trying to get in 10 blue links. There's a lot of other questions like how do you emerge, how do you appear in Perplexity's results? How do you appear in you know, OpenAI's search engine, Anthropic's results? What it means to optimize for search is going to change a lot. So that's one. The other piece that is pretty important is the way that content is created to answer these questions that people have is also changing. So the previous generation of programmatic SEO, you could create very templated answers to very like templated questions, how to watch blank. Okay, here's how you watch blank. And you can like literally template that. And same with Zapier's approach, right? How do I connect SAS A and SAS B? It's super templated. But now with AI, you can create much more, like far more customized, flexible, uh, and like in general, higher quality answers to a wider and wider range of search queries that are not so so rigid in their structure. So the combination of, okay, like all of search itself is fundamentally changing and the way that the answers to search are created by businesses and companies and individuals through content, that's changing too. So if you look at those two changes that are like super foundational and the fact that this is all happening so quickly, it's like, wow, this is a really interesting problem because no matter how you look at it or what changes, it's pretty clear that search will remain like a massively valuable acquisition channel in the future. But there's a lot that's, you know, a lot of like bumps and 
things that are changing in the short term, like, oh, well, you know, is there going to be more zero click search results? What percentage of search will Google take? What percentage will go to other companies? There's a lot of open questions. But I felt like fundamentally, it's a really exciting area to build in because the requirements to deal with the channel are changing so rapidly. It sounds like everything you said ends up often getting wrapped up in this phrase like SEO is dead. And that just, I think, completely misses the mark on what is actually happening and just fear mongering. Uh, maybe they have something to sell. But you mentioned, at, at least what I'm gathering from what you mentioned is like, search is going to stay around. It's just the way that search is done, like how people are going to search. And it's kind of already starting to change, but that's going to start accelerating. And even the way information is presented, and you had mentioned the question, like, how do you show up in these other search engines like Perplexity, ChatGPT, Anthropic? I know you don't have like the end all be all truth to that question, but I'm curious what what hypotheses you might have for that. Yeah, I think that to us right now is still a very open loop. And we want to start working with some of the leaders in the space to start figuring out the answers to these questions. But it's so early, like Perplexity just announced, like I think probably a few weeks ago that they're going to do like advertising. And that's like a whole thing that's coming up. So they'll probably start working with publishers more and things like that. And we want to, you know, we'll probably want to talk to them a little bit more about that stuff as well. But I think as far as how you appear in, you know, in more like chat-based experiences, what you can notice for ChatGPT, for example, is that a lot of what results they surface, like the sources they surface, are very similar to what surfaces at the top of Bing. So right now, it seems like there's a lot of overlap between what is surfaced in these chatbots and what's surfaced in search engines. But, you know, chatbot optimization, if you could call it that, is a very like untested type of area. I think on the daydream side, we've been less focused on optimizing for upstart search engines right now, mostly because we're, we're focusing on the second trend that I mentioned, which is how do you actually absorb, um, how do you build a, a very good contextual understanding of what a company is doing and then produce really valuable content from that. And at the moment, Google still is the most valuable channel and there's not much point right now, we feel, in trying to focus on like all the other indexing layer competitors. But in terms of how we do, but, but that's definitely like a focus for the medium to longer term is how do you uh, start thinking about those problems at least. But my sense is right now for most companies, it's not, it's not going to be like the primary thing on their mind. Google is still the major driver, but it's time to start thinking about that. So on the daydream side, we need to do more work to actually think about how we're going to do that. But it's something that we feel like is like very foundational to the future of search and we want to be on top of it. It makes sense that you're kind of like, it's too early to even be focusing on that, that first wave of change. And the, the part that we probably have a lot more control of is around, hey, how do we produce content that's a lot more, sure, it's programmatic, but tailored to each of these different variations of searches. So talk more about that and how Daydream helps folks with creating that programmatic content. Yeah, so the idea that the basic view I have is if you look at how much, like when we did our fundraising exercise, you, you, know, you usually look at like what's a top-down estimate of spend in a particular acquisition channel. In our case, search, that's like a, an SEO and content. The estimate that we came up with, obviously these things can be like a little bit fuzzy, but it's around like 100 billion in spend on SEO and content combined per year. And so you think, where's that money actually going? Well, that money is not going to like software it's going to services. So it's going to writers, agencies, consultants that are helping to orchestrate this like whole SEO motion. But what are those people doing, right? And you can break it into a few buckets. So they're helping you identify what search patterns to go after. Then they're creating content to go after those search patterns. Then they're monitoring the performance and they're iterating. Like that, Those are the four primary pieces of SEO. So on the Daydream side, what we're really focused on right now is there's a lot of search queries that you actually can generate a really strong AI generated answer for, but the level of detail you need and the level of focus you need uh, to create something that's like in the 90th percentile of quality. So not just like some average, okay AI answer, but something really good is fairly high. 
And why is that? It's because to create like a really good piece of content, ChatGPT, for example, if you just use it, it doesn't have any context on what your company does. It's also, it has like a cutoff for the training date. So it's like a lot of ChatGPT or AI generated content right now is almost like telling someone, hey, here's no context on my company. And you also can't look at anything that has come out on the internet in like last year or whatever it is, and then go write something. So of course, it's not going to be great. But our view is if you can build a platform that's very strong at absorbing all of the interesting data points that are going to be valuable valuable to from a reader's perspective, um, and you can pair that with a lot of other optimizations around tone, styling, and especially like scaling out answers of a particular query, that's like something that's valuable today because if they don't use Daydream, there's a limited number of options, be it like finding a person to write these things, which at a certain scale doesn't make sense, or you hire an agency or someone like that, but that can often be like pretty expensive. So Daydream, Daydream sits in this place of, hey, if you have, if you're in an industry where there's a lot of search uh, in the long tail and you don't know how to target it, but you have, you know, you're, you're positioned in a way where you have unique data or something that's valuable to the readers, you can use Daydream to help you get the value of that by taking those data points and then building like very thoughtful content campaigns at scale around them. So that's basically what we do. And so is it like rather than just a single input that like you would with ChatGPT of like, here's a prompt, it sounds like it's taking information from your entire company website, maybe a proprietary database or something that you have and information about your product and tone and voice and all that. And all of those are taking it into consideration with producing the content? Yeah. So if you think about where, like, in general, when we think about SEO, what you think, what, what you can relatively, you, you can pretty safely assume is that what the, the internet will value in the long term, and this, this includes, like, the indexing layer players, so like Google and ChatGPT, is, like, net new insights contributed to the internet. So if you're going to contribute net new insights to the internet, where does that come from? Well, a lot of it, a lot of that will be stored inside the company. So if the company has data points on, so I can give you like a few examples. So Notion, for example, obviously has a lot of interesting data about templates. They're one of our customers. Product Hunt has interesting data on like startups. Like these are valuable data sets that they've built themselves. And those are, those are like a perfect, kind of in the perfect place to, if you can access them and then uh, inform great content by using those data points, that's, that's interesting. So that's internal context. Then there's external context. So, for example, there's a lot of government databases that have information about particular things, but they're formatted terribly. So there's actually a lot of, lot of alpha in being able to look at those databases, pull the data from them, but then summarize them in a way that's easy to understand. So that's like an external data source. So Daydream currently is able to absorb any data source inside a company and any data source externally on the public web, even if the model's not trained on it. So between those two things, it actually solves one of the most foundational problems of creating great content using AI, which is context. But if you can build integrations that take internal context and any external context, now there's not really anything that's off limits in terms of from a pure context standpoint. And that's like the seed of creating unique differentiated content, which is what matters long term for SEO. Yeah, I'd love to get more into weeds on that point, because I know like I've spoken to someone and they've referred to programmatic SEO as say something like Zillow, where you have a database of all these homes and their prices and locations and all of that. And I think that's very simple where I don't know, that information just gets reflected on a website with like tokens and placeholders and all of that. But from what you're saying, it sounds like it might be something different where those are inputs that inform how, what type of content is generated. So I don't know if you can use a specific example of maybe the type of data or something that Notion or Product Hunt is using and then how that informs the content. Like what's what's the actual output for them? And maybe it's about like scaling one of the existing things. So it's not like, I don't know, something confidential. Yeah. So I'd say um, probably a good example to give is just a good example would be for Notion. You know, Notion's unique data is like its templates. So the question is, how do you make the most of that? Well, one, one important thing is there's a lot of, you know, people might search something like best habit tracker template or best personal planner template. So the exercise of taking all of these templates that, you know, Notion has built out 
and then creating thoughtful listicles that are categorized appropriately and things like that's that's an example of a use case that's that's like notions data advantage for a company like canva it's their it, they have a very similar thing they have like their templates for zapier their data source is all these like integrations that they've built so in each case what you see is a company that's actually built some type of data edge by in the way that they built the product and then our job is to basically take that data edge and parlay it into like a growth marketing SEO edge. So that's kind of the, the idea. It's interesting what I think you described it earlier where the type of person who would want to run these types of plays would have some product thinking, would have some marketing background, would know SEO and like maybe have some data background as well to be able to build out a, a programmatic SEO uh, program. And I'm thinking about like even in that question itself of how do we use data to inform building out this like program? I don't think the average person would be able to understand that. So it's it's interesting. I'm I'm wondering how you start getting more folks building using Daydream to build out these programs. Like is is there like an education layer of like, hey, this is how it works? I think that's the hardest part right now is you look at um like a lot of times a company will come to us and be like, we want to do SEO. But it literally stops there. So I think a lot of even even like growth marketing leaders, their knowledge goes as far as we know SEO is a big channel. We know some examples of companies that have pulled it off really well. But then from there, like, what is the strategy? What search pattern should I go after? This is, it, it really stops there. So with Daydream, like in the first phase is literally we do a strategy audit. So that's like, okay, give us context on your company, who the ICP is. And from there, we'll basically create a, you know, from, from, from that point, we'll basically create a strategy of here are the different search patterns that matter in your industry. Here is the intent. Here's the, the size of that opportunity. And then we say, hey, then, you know, given that these are the searches that matter and these are the interesting data points you have, this is what we would create to serve those searches. And then it kind of ties it together. But you think like for, even for the average, like growth marketer they're not as deep enough in the channel usually to figure this out themselves so there is an education component this is i think something that we're super keen to get better at with daydream and really take a a leading role in is educating the industry about how to do this because even when we get questions like where would you go to learn programmatic seo we don't really have a go-to resource that will point people to so part of what we would like to do is really make a lot of the education public over time so that when companies come to us It could be that, you know, they come to us after they've read a bunch of interesting things about a a, a, read a bunch of our guides on programmatic SEO, et cetera, have seen some of our case studies. Like we also publish uh, deep dives into the programmatic SEO strategies of companies like Monday, G2, Canva. There's a whole bunch on our website. So, yeah, there is a very heavy education component right now. And I think it's partly because especially with the way AI has changed things. The industry is just not that up to speed, but that's our job to educate them. We've had a couple of clients ask to do programmatic SEO. And once you ask what they think that means, it, it just completely falls apart. And then there's an education aspect and we're like, it doesn't even make sense for you. But I had to explain what exactly it was first before they understood, oh, that doesn't make sense for us. So it's kind of a a weird thing where with AI and the automations available and the ease of producing content now, I think folks started asking for that without truly knowing what they were asking for or whether it makes sense. But um, I think you you had mentioned previously that the goal is to automate a lot of these different things. And I think it begs the question of what does this mean for how we do SEO moving forward? Yeah, I think what it means is that uh, SEO, I I previously said four things, but it's actually four things plus plus one. So SEO right now is identify the keywords, search patterns, create the content, monitor the performance and iterate. I think those four pieces will be automated to a large degree or there will be enough, like there will be enough automation that the average growth person with reasonably smart can go and actually like do a lot of these things that previously required some of those super technical. So we're trying to build a bunch of layers of abstraction on top of this whole like SEO strategy execution piece that 
uh, will make it much easier for people that are not specialized to understand how to drive the playbook. So then that begs the question that you're talking about, which is then, then what happens in this industry? Well, I think the plus one piece I was mentioning is strategy. So the understanding of here's our product, here's the unique data points we have. And based on this and how our competitors moving, how the industry is changing, this is, you know, this is, this is some of the, this is the rough direction we'd like to go in for SEO. So this whole strategy piece of having context on the company, the product, the data, and using that to inform strategy, that I think becomes really valuable. But then a lot of the tactical pieces like keyword research, writing content, generating reports, like this stuff is very primed for automation. So I think what you see over time is, I think this is happening in SEO, but actually across all the channels, it's like AI enables you to get a lot of leverage and build some good layers of abstraction such that you don't need to be so technical in each channel. And it empowers the average growth person to have a lot more leverage in executing across these channels, even if they don't have specialized knowledge. Then what becomes really important over time is like things that have always been valuable. Like, is it like, what is this person's like product sense? How good are they at understanding the product and the data that the company has and parlaying that into a growth strategy? So I think technical, tactical stuff becomes less valuable because it gets automated more. And I think strategy and the ability to drive those initiatives becomes more valuable. So that's for SEO, but it's also generalizable to, I think, go to market uh, and the way it's changing in general. Yeah. What does that look like to, to spend more time on strategy? Because e- even the concept itself, I know it's, from speaking to a lot of folks, it's very nebulous. So maybe if we just use SEO as an example, like the specific thing here, knowing that kind of all marketing is kind of the roles are getting impacted with automation and all that. But if we look at SEO, what does it mean to focus on strategy? I think it's, it means being very product led. So a lot of SEO thinking like in the industry right now is still very short term focus. It's, it's still, it's still tied to this like older idea of doing SEO well is hacking and I don't know, like (laughs) doing whatever to basically just get to the top. And that leads to a lot of short term thinking. So, you know, I published a, a blog post about why. Backlink should basically be just a result of having good product market fit and you shouldn't spend time building backlinks. So like, just think about that, right? A whole part of the SEO industry right now is focused on building backlinks in a way that's like, you know, sometimes outright black hat, which is like paying for links or data journalism, uh, which we actually did a little bit of at Flix, which is much better because you're actually creating some kind of like unique research and you're disseminating it. But it's still like you're separating link building into like a distinct practice that you're spending money on. That's not very product-led thinking. That's like more short-term tactical thinking. And I don't think it actually works out well in the long term. The reason for that is you could look at companies like, you know, look at Tome, Tome Generative AI Presentations Company. Their domain authority is like quite high. And it's not like they spent a bunch of time trying to figure out how to build links. They just had a good product and they got a lot of attention and then they got links. Mostly because like backlinks are a proxy indicator of value created on the internet. So the companies that do the best at that just focus on building something that creates a lot of value and then they accumulate links as a result. Uh, But companies that are more short-term focused, instead of focusing on the bigger thing, which is creating value and getting links as a byproduct, they just focus on shortcutting to getting links in general. And like, that's not a good practice, right? Or, Or just being focused on like, here are the keywords and let's just do that. And let's just write a bunch of like articles and let's not think about you know, how we can create a unique and differentiated answer based on the pros that are, uh, or like the unique advantages our product has. That's like non-product-led SEO thinking. But product-led thinking is more like, okay, you're Zillow and you happen to have all this data on like real estate stuff. Well, actually that enables you to create really good answers to a lot of questions about how to, you know, or what houses to buy and et cetera. So I think like the ability to have good fundamentals on like product and growth will become very important over time because that that strategy piece and figuring that out is the most important thing. And then all the tactical details of how you actually create the pages, how you monitor performance on them, like that stuff is more tactical and is ripe for automation. So yeah, it's it's almost like all the things that most people think of when they think of SEO is all tactical stuff and it's the strategy that and not the thinking behind it that doesn't get much attention because I don't know, it's not as actionable. So people don't write about it, but 
but I, I wrote a newsletter about like the SEO is a product, a product manager. And I got some, some good feedback on it, but I, I think that that's going to be direction. I mean, you're kind of validating it right now. So I'm feeling good about myself, but I think the SEO is going to turn, it's going to be, I wouldn't be surprised if like they were viewed less as a marketer and more of a product manager to figure out like, okay, how does, how does this thing not just like be a marketing channel, but how do we like utilize more of our product and our data to, to inform marketing essentially, or even drive it? Yeah, I mean, I think some of the, some companies have already started making the switch from making SEO a marketing role to a product role, like Coinbase SEO. A lot of the SEO there is done from the product team. Airbnb is a good example too. Like SEO was a core part; uh, uh, it was like a product function, uh, much less a marketing one. So I think it reflects a shift that's still not really like it, it, th- th- there's not that many companies that have really come to accept that fully. But I think you'll see more of that over time. So we've spent a lot of time talking about SEO. I'd like to kind of switch gears and talk about building a company. You mentioned in passing this idea of taking a calm approach to building a company. What do you mean by that? Because you have investors. and I'm not sure how calm that can get. Yeah, it's a good question. So I think the root of that, I think I, I, I say, I, I use that word less now because the whole calm thing is associated with like, a trade-off on scale or speed. It's like it's. It almost implies like you're going to do it slower when, when you, you when people say that. But my my thought was just like it doesn't like panicking and being like super stressed and stuff. I don't know that it actually has ever like bad stress. Essentially, it doesn't really help like get the job done. So let's say something goes wrong in the company. If I'm spending my time like ruminating on it and being like really panicked and upset. And essentially I'm going up and down in the same way the company's going up and down. It doesn't really like help you solve the problem in front of you. So I think it's good to have a certain level of separation between yourself and the company so that even as the company is going up and down, you can like be more stable. And I found that that's what I need to just focus on solving the problem. So I guess it sounds maybe like like a different way of doing things, but to me it's like it, it just seems like I don't see any benefit in like getting really caught up in my own, like whatever I should just go fix the problem. And so I guess the reason maybe that that's come up a few times in like when I've talked to different people or they've met me is there's an idea in startups that like my, I'm, things are always on fire. It's so hard. You know, like there's all these like narratives around that, that like basically validate that it's, it's like very normal to just be like super stressed out and this and that and whatever. And there's some element of like, yeah, you start a new company. It's just in general, a more volatile thing, uh, like a more volatile, I guess, business, because it's like super early on, there's a lot more risks that are unchecked and things like that. But, but I think there can be some danger in like just validating yourself that things are supposed to be chaotic all the time, because maybe they actually don't like, maybe that's, maybe you're succeeding in spite of that, not because of that. So I think my philosophy has just been make sure that even as the company is going up and down, I can just have some level of stability, which means I need to be grounded myself. And I think that really affects also the way the people around you work. So it's like, no matter what challenge comes up, okay, it came up. Let's like not get, let's not expend too much energy worrying about this. Let's just figure out what the solution is. Let's keep moving, get past this one, go to the next one, get past move, and then go to the next one. And then that's, I think how you build a great company is like, you don't spend too much time worrying about these things. You just go and solve it. But obviously it's easier said than done. And so I don't have like a super concrete philosophy on like exactly what that calm company means. But I think for me personally, it just means I don't go up and down with my company. I just focus on getting the job done. And that requires that I like reject some of these narratives of like, oh, of course it's supposed to be chaotic and this and that. There's always going to be some element of that, but I don't need to indulge that and then like create more problems for myself, which I think is a very common thing in like the founder community. kindred spirits in that respect where like I'm building a, an agency, which I've, someone has actually told to me, told me like, oh, you must be a masochist because agencies are so hard. I'm like, are they really? I mean, there are literally millions of agencies. The blueprint's been built out. Like it's not, 
sure it's difficult, but it, it doesn't have to be like that crazy or like as bad as people say it is. So I, I love that you question kind of those narratives. And internally, we also, I mean, some people call it stoic. I, I know you lived in a Zen Buddhist temple for like almost two years. So if anything, I'd, I'd say it's described as more like Buddhist. You're kind of disconnecting from that and very, you're very Zen about things when <laughs> issues, <laughs> issues come up. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of this also just depends. So when I was running the bootstrap company, people, I had a, sim- I had a similar way of looking at operating and things like that. And the initial question was like, oh, well, can you do that? Cause you're bootstrapped. And then I thought to myself, oh, this is going to be interesting because maybe when it's venture backed, this whole dynamic changes. Actually, it doesn't because I realized like a lot of the environment of a startup or how it feels has mostly to do with like the psychology of the person. So if the person in general in their life is like super reactive and neurotic and anxious and like worrying about things all the time, then of course the company is going to turn out that way. But if the person is not like that, then it's just going to be more like chill not in a non-ambitious way, but just like, it's not going to be as chaotic for unnecessary reasons. But yeah, I did, I did learn a bunch of that in, uh, in the Zen Buddhist temple. We can talk about that too, if that's interesting to you as well. Yeah. How'd you end up living in a Zen Buddhist temple for almost two years? What prompted that? Uh, yeah. So I, I think the backstory was basically, you know, I'm Sri Lankan. So Sri Lanka is like a majority Buddhist country. I grew up in Canada. Uh, I used to go to Buddhist school. But at the time, the type of Buddhism I was learning, I wasn't super interested in because there's a lot of like history and ethics and things. And then you think like, well, what does this have to do with my life? But I got back into it in college. Like we had a campus meditation club and I thought, oh, this is just very practical. You go there, you sit for an hour and then you just feel like more relaxed when you come out. So when I moved to San Francisco, I was looking for a place to just sit, uh, sit, meaning meditate. And uh, I went to the San Francisco Zen Center, which is um, one of the largest Zen Buddhist temples in America. Uh, If anyone's heard of the book Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind, or this quote, like, in the mind of the beginner, there are many possibilities. In the mind of the expert, there are a few. That's attributed to the founder of San Francisco Zen Center. And that temple in Hayes Valley is actually called Beginner's Mind Temple. So... I went there mostly just to have a place to go meditate on the weekends, but I ended up meeting uh, one of the Zen priests. So in uh, the Zen tradition, they're called priests, not monks, which is a whole other thing. I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It changed, I think, as it came through India and then to China and then Japan. But uh, this monk had been a banker at Citibank and then had uh, this this priest had, had been a banker at Citibank and then had quit. And then become a Zen priest and just had a lot of really interesting talks on like how Buddhist principles are applicable in everyday life for like the average person that's working a job in tech or finance or whatever it might be. And that was super refreshing to me. So it's like, this is not like some theoretical, super abstract, like academic subject. This is actually something that's much more applicable in my day-to-day life. And what I noticed in startups in particular is... Uh, startups are really good at like creating all kinds of problems and dilemmas, especially as they relate to other people. And if I'm like reacting to every single thing and like getting in my own head about it, uh, then it's really hard because I'm like being carried by the momentum of my problems. And if you choose to do a startup, there's the momentum of problems is just like very, it just like keeps going. So I realized, I think like in a nutshell that the thing that's, interesting about the whole buddhist thing is that it gives you a bit more react like space between when something happens and when you react to it and that was super useful so it's not like immediately like the thing happens and then i'm suddenly like just being taken on for a ride there's like a bit more space i think is like there's a whole like thing we could get into there about exactly like what changes and all this but i would sum it up as like you just have more space And I think that's been really helpful um, to just be aware of like, what are my thought patterns? What are the things that pull me more? What are the things that pull me less? And I think probably the biggest thing is not fusing my identity into the company. So like Buddhism, a lot of it's about this idea that when you form attachment to things, that creates like a, like a, it creates like suffering. And so it's super easy if you're building a company to fuse your identity into it. 
And then now you have an attachment. And then once you have the attachment, as the company goes up and down, you go up and down. And so what I found out with the Buddhist stuff is it's really about like letting that go. I am separate from the company and having like a sense of very, just like this, like a sense that like when I'm not holding onto the company so tightly and I'm not absorbing it into my personal identity, it's easier to look at it as something I work on rather than when something's wrong with the company. I'm like, it almost feels like something's wrong with me and I need to go fix it. And like, there's this whole thing, right? But I think for a lot of founders, you like fuse your identity in the company because you think it's so important. But that paradoxically makes it harder for you to deal with the ups and downs because you're going up and down with the company. Um, and I know there's a whole like different, there's a spectrum of different views on this. Like, obviously, there are people that have fused their identities into their company to the max and they still, and they do really well. And there's plenty of those examples. I just don't know that that's the only way to do it. So that's kind of like my meta experiment with building the company is like, can I build something that has like a world-class outcome, but in a way that feels more aligned to my way of living? Because I don't think I can be like, call it like the more traditional archetype, which is like super neurotic and like I'm sleeping under my desk and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It reminds me a lot of the, the base camp guys. Like the, I just actually got their book. Like it doesn't have to be crazy at work. And it, what's really cool is hearing you approaching building the company like this from the beginning versus I think for a lot of other people, you hear them being a lot more Zen after they tied their identity for like 10 years plus to their business and like can now step back. It's like, oh yeah, sure. You can say that now, but you're actually doing that from the beginning. So that that's really cool to hear. The, the only other thing I would add is like, e- even with Basecamp, like Basecamp, I think was, correct me if I'm wrong on any of these subjects too, but I think they were more okay with building like a stable, steadily growing company, but not necessarily something that's meant to go like fully bent down the venture track. I actually do want to do that. So then, the, then the, the question is like, there's not that many examples of people that embrace this lifestyle, but then also did not compromise on like, call it more of the traditional markers of success with the company, be it scale, growth rate, size, like all that kind of stuff. But for me, I actually do want to see like, with the track that the company is on, so we, we've raised two rounds, we haven't announced one, but it'll probably be announced by the time this podcast comes out. Can you build a venture back company that grows quickly on like, like a venture track and still live life in this way? That's the experiment. And I didn't find many examples of people that did that. So that's part of also what made it intriguing for me to personally go pursue that myself. Yeah, it's really cool. We now have you on record. So in five to seven, maybe <laughs> we'll 10 see. years, we can look back we'll and see. be like, see, see what's changed, if anything, yeah. hopefully nothing. Well, I know we're coming up on time. I, I'd love to ask you a couple closing questions and we can wrap it up. Yeah, let's do it. All right. What is one opinion you have about business you think people would disagree with? I, I think it really would relate to what we just talked about, which is I don't know that being super fear driven is actually the best way to get things done. Um, I think if you're motivated by curiosity and less of like the chip on your shoulder, that's a stronger and more sustainable way to stay motivated and achieve results with less like collateral damage than being super driven by like your own fear or insecurity or chip on your shoulder or whatever. Yeah. I feel like more people should hear that. Um, all right. What is, and maybe this is related, but what's one impactful piece of advice you've been given? My trainer says this. So he's like, you know, your mind and your body are the only things you have with you until you're completely, you know, off the face of the earth. Um, but they're also the things we prioritize last. So that's been a reminder to me to just make sure I take care of those things. Because when I start taking care of those things, then everything around me starts to kind of like get shaky too. Yeah, I find out for myself too. All right. What's one book you'd recommend more people read? This might be a little bit uh, random, but I read a book called Out of the Gobi. The full title is Out of the Gobi, My Story of China and America. It's basically about uh, someone who um, was exiled into the Gobi Desert during the Cultural Revolution when they were a kid, Oh, uh, was denied an education, eventually went to school, became in the first batch of students to come to America for school, did a PhD under Janet Yellen eventually. Anyhow, this guy basically went from like, where he was. And I think now he runs like the largest PE fund in Asia or something, but it's just a crazy story of resilience. So it was a great, great book. Ooh, I'm getting chills. Um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm getting chills because, so my girlfriend's Chinese. I read the three body problem trilogy like, uh, like a year or two ago. And 
they reference a lot of the cultural revolution. I, I would like to turn her ask all these questions for some reason thinking she would know. But she actually shared that like she knows she's heard stories from like her grandparents about like their experience through all that stuff. So and we just had this conversation literally like two days ago. And so it was very timely to kind of hear you recommend this book. I'm gonna look into that. Thank you for that. Yeah, no problem. All right. And then last question here is where can people find you on the internet? So I'm on Twitter, Danuka underscore K uh, on, sorry, X on X on the X platform. Uh, also on LinkedIn, LinkedIn slash in slash Danuka. And uh, you can also reach me at uh, Danuka at with daydream.com. So any of those. Sweet. We'll add links to all those in the show notes. And it was a pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks for making the time. Awesome. Thanks, man. 